Chapter 15. Contender. Not much happened in the three weeks after they broke into Thunder Foods. That's how undercover missions usually work. You find a few things out quickly, then it starts getting tougher. You have to be patient, slowly winning the confidence of your targets and working your way deeper into an organisation. Meryl Spencer sent James an email to say Lauren had completed her first week of training and was coping well. Nicole had put listening devices and miniature cameras around Keith Moore's house. James still liked Nicole, but he hadn't kissed her after the first time because he was more interested in Kerry. Kerry had wired Mr Singh's house with microphones and was spending a lot of time with Dinesh, trying to squeeze out more information. James still hadn't found the right moment to tell Kerry how he felt about her. At least, that's what he told Kyle. There had been loads of opportunities, but James always chickened out. Kyle had given up targeting Ringo Moore and was helping a couple of Year 10 kids make deliveries for KMG on weekends. James still couldn't get his head around Kyle being gay, but it hadn't changed anything in their day-to-day -day lives. Some days, James almost forgot he was on a mission. It was like being a normal kid, getting up and playing with Joshua, going to school, sitting through boring lessons or bunking off, coming home and eating whatever frozen delight Zara had warmed in the oven, then going out making deliveries. It wasn't a bad life. There was $100 a week in drug money to spend. James had got new jeans and tracksuit tops, video games, and the dearest Nike trainers he could find. School was a DOS, and Junior and James always messed around and had a laugh. The two boys had loads in common. They both supported Arsenal, hated school, liked PlayStation, and had similar tastes in music and girls. James hadn't been in a proper three-round fight yet, but he'd done some sparring and loved the buzz you got in the boxing ring. As soon as you got punched, the chemicals in your body rise up and make you mad, like somebody plugged you into the electricity. Your bad side takes over, and you're not scared of anything. James couldn't manage Ken's target of 150 skips a minute, but he got well past the stage where the other boys pissed themselves laughing every time he picked up a rope. He stopped skipping and mopped the sweat off his face when Kelvin called him to ringside. One round sparring with Dell, Kelvin said. Dell had a longer reach and seven fights under his belt, but James wasn't worried as he stepped through the ropes wearing gloves and a headguard. James was built for boxing, solid arms, big shoulders, and strong enough to take a punch. Touch gloves, Kelvin said, stepping back from the two fighters. James charged forward on the bell. Dell landed the first hit, glancing a blow on the side of James's headguard. James hit Dell's head harder, sunk another punch in Dell's guts, and then covered his face, blocking Dell's jabs while spying for an opening through the crack between his gloves. When it came, James pounced forward and landed his glove in Dell's face. The next punch caught Dell off balance, sprawling him out over the canvas. James wanted Dell to get up so he could thump him again, but Dell waved his gloves in front of his face and crawled to the ropes. James was disgusted. He spat out his mouth guard before tugging off his glove and hurling it at Dell's back. Call that a fight, he shouted. Come back for some more, you little wimp. Calvin grabbed James by his shoulders and pulled him backwards. Cool it, tiger, he grinned. Try and remember, this is amateur boxing. You win on the number of clean punches you land not on how hard you punch, or even how many times you knock the other guy down. I want to fight somebody really good next time. Calvin laughed. <laughs> You're a strong lad, James, but you need to work on your speed, so don't start getting cocky. James unbuckled his head guard and jumped out of the ring. Junior was walking towards him. You almost look good enough to fight me, Junior said, smiling. I'd fight you now if they'd let me. Dell had staggered around from the other side of the ring. His hair was soaked in sweat where it had been trapped under his headguard. Oh, you're too strong for me, Dell gasped. Sorry I called you a wimp, James said. I got carried away. Dell and James gave each other a sweaty hug. It was always the same. In the ring, you wanted to kill someone, but once you got out, you were mates again. As James walked over to his training pals, Calvin called him back. I hear you've been a reliable delivery boy since you started, Calvin said. Don't think it's gone unnoticed. Cheers, James said, his mind still fixed inside the ring. You fancy a little train ride tomorrow evening? How far? James asked. We need a package delivered down St Albans Way. 
You up for it? Sure. There's 12 kilos of coke split into four bricks. Get someone you can rely on to help you carry it. You'll earn 40 pounds each. Sounds fair, James said. Where do I pick the stuff up? You know Costas? James nodded. I've seen him around. He'll meet you in the Thornton playground at about six o'clock. Bring your mate so we can check him out. Kyle was on another delivery, so James offered the job to Kerry. It's 15 minutes ride on the train, James said, and we'll be earning 20 pounds each. Kerry shrugged. I was going to do homework with Dinesh after school, but I'm not getting anything new out of him. It was a drizzly night, so nobody else was in the playground. Costas was a burly 16-year-old who dropped out of school the year before. His face was a mass of zits, and he didn't like the look of Kerry. Are you kidding me? He asked. You weren't supposed to bring your girlfriend. You need someone with a bit of presence in case there's trouble. This was arranged at short notice, James said. Kerry's all I could get, and she's well up to the job. Costas looked at Kerry. No offence, babe, but we don't use little girls. Unless you were a very large person, preferably armed with a baseball bat, calling Kerry babe was a seriously bad idea. I'm not your babe, Kerry sniffed, and I'm quite capable of defending myself. <laughs> I'm sure you are, sweetie, Costas sniggered. Sorry, James, but this is not going to happen. Bringing a chick on a delivery man? What are you thinking? Give us those drugs, Kerry said furiously, or you're in deep trouble. James smiled at her. Kerry, calm down. I'll make a couple of phone calls and smooth this out. No, Kerry said. I'm not letting this bag of pus talk to me like that. Costa snorted noisily. <laughs> what are you going to do, baby cakes? Pull my hair? Kerry lunged forward, slamming a karate chop into the front of Costas's neck and sweeping his legs away as he stumbled backwards. Costas was on the ground with Kerry's knee crushing his windpipe before he even realised the fight had started. Baby cakes? Kerry shouted, pressing her knee in harder as Costas gasped for breath. Nobody calls me baby cakes. Okay, Costas gurgled. I'm sorry, you can go with James. Kerry stood up and let Costas sit still while his face returned to its normal colour. You surprised me, Costas said angrily as he got to his feet. But you better not try anything like that again or I'll seriously hurt you. Kerry couldn't help grinning. I'll try to keep that in mind. Costas made sure nobody was around before unzipping his backpack. Kerry and James each grabbed two plastic wrapped bricks of white powder and tucked them in their backpacks. James started walking away. Hang on, Costas said, unless you want me to keep the 80 quid. Kerry snatched the money out of Costas's hand. Pleasure doing business, she said. She started jogging after James. 80 quid, James? Kerry said angrily. I can't believe you tried to rip me off when you've got a roll of 20s in your pocket and I'm only getting pocket money. It was a mistake, James lied. You can have half, of course. I'm keeping the lot, Kerry said, tucking the money into her jeans, unless you want to fight me for it. Chapter 16. Lost. James and Kerry stepped off the train onto the platform at St Albans. It's a shame we couldn't have got here earlier in the day. Kerry said. St Albans is really historic. There's Roman ruins and mosaics and stuff. Tragic, James said sarcastically. Nothing gets my pulse racing like a good mosaic. We're not going into town anyway. We've got to get out to some housing estate. Taxis were lined up outside the station. The driver wanted to see James's money before he'd take them anywhere. The ride took them past farms and some seriously expensive houses. Then from nowhere they found themselves surrounded by graffiti and concrete. It was like an alien spaceship had sucked a housing estate out of the middle of London, then decided it didn't like the look of it and dumped it in the middle of nowhere. The cab pulled up outside a shopping arcade. Everything was boarded up except a pub that had been converted into a snooker club. It had a reinforced metal door and bars over the slits of glass that passed for windows. Kerry looked around nervously as the cab pulled away. It was already turning dark. It must be the pits living in a place like this, James said. Thornton may be a dump, but at least it's near to town. 
Out here, you've got nothing. It turned out the shops were the high point of the area. Beyond them were eight low-rise housing blocks. Three were boarded up, with condemned building notices and signs warning people not to go inside without masks to protect them against asbestos dust. There was a pack of dogs roaming around, druggies in dark corners, and the only normal-looking people you saw walked fast, like they were afraid of being mugged. James got the directions out of his pocket. 22, third floor, Mullion House. They found Mullion House, then walked up a foul-smelling staircase and along the third floor balcony. The door numbers ended at 20. James rang the bell, and an Eastern European-sounding woman shouted out of the letterbox in bad English. What is you like? Do you know where number 22 is? James asked. What? She shouted. Number 22? Wait, I fetch my son. The kid who came to the letterbox was about 10. His English was perfect. There's no number 22, he explained. I think all the floors are the same. It only goes up to 20. Cheers, James said miserably, turning away from the letterbox. Sorry to bother you. What do we do now? Kerry asked. There's obviously a mistake with the address, James said. I'll call the lady who rings my deliveries through. She'll sort us out. James pulled his mobile out of his tracksuit and dialed. The phone made a bleep and a message flashed on the display. No signal. Kerry tried hers and got the same. Crap, James said. You really know you're in the middle of nowhere when you can't get a mobile signal? Kerry looked down off the balcony towards the shops. There's a phone box by the bus stop, she said. James looked down. I'd put the odds of it working at something like a million to one. They didn't have any other choice, so they went to take a look. The phone wasn't so much vandalised as annihilated. There was no glass, no handset and no buttons. Just a burned up mess. This place is giving me the creeps, Kerry said. Do you think they'd let us phone from inside the snooker club? No, I wouldn't chance it, James said. It looks like the kind of place where you'd get your throat cut. So what then? Kerry asked. Let's get the hell out of here. There's no way to call another cab, so we'll wait for the bus. Our phones will work once we get into town. I'll make some calls and sort this shambles out. They wandered across to the bus stop. Kerry glanced at the timetable. There's only one bus an hour, she said. I think we just missed one. There was hardly any traffic about. They sat on the pavement near the bus stop with their feet in the gutter. Kerry picked a dandelion from a crack in the tarmac and twirled it between her fingers. Do you think we'll get in trouble with KMG for this? She asked. I've got the bit of paper with the address written in Kelvin's writing, so they can hardly blame me. It's pretty incredible, Kerry said. James nodded. Especially when you think what these drugs are worth. How much? Kerry asked. There's 12 kilos. I sell coke for 60 a gram, and there's a thousand grams in a kilo, so each kilo is worth 60,000 pounds. That's 720,000 altogether. Wow, Kerry gasped. That makes our 80 pound delivery fee look a lot less generous. Of course, that's the street price and this is being sold wholesale, but I'd still bet KMG isn't shifting this lot for any less than 300 grand. You could buy a nice house with that sort of money. James giggled. <laughs> Maybe we should do a runner. You know, it's cool the way you can do those sums in your head. I've been able to do it since nursery, James said. Before my mum died, she ran this huge shoplifting gang and she got me to work out her sums, like who owed how much and who was due what wages. Did she ever get busted? Kerry asked. James shook his head. Nope. But when I was little, I used to have nightmares where the police came and took mum and Lauren away. Junior made some comment the other day about his dad ending up in prison. He acted like it was a joke, but I could tell it worries him. I remembered how I used to be and it made me feel really shitty about us using him to help put his dad in jail. I suppose every bad guy has someone who loves them, Kerry said. They watched the sunset as the minutes dragged by. When the streetlights flicked on, James looked at his watch. The bus shouldn't be long now, Kerry said. Three lads came out of the snooker club and started walking towards them. One was a big guy in his twenties, with a beard and curly brown hair down his back. The other two were skinheads in their late teens, probably brothers, 
with ghostly complexions and spinely limbs. They weren't the first people who'd passed by, but something about them put Kerry and James on edge. The taller skinhead stopped by Kerry. Waiting for a bus? He asked. Yes, Kerry said, standing up. That's what people usually do at bus stops. I thought you might be waiting for a hunk like me to come by and sweep you off your feet. The shorter one gave James a shove. You a boyfriend, blondie? Piss off, James said, shoving him back. Got any money? Shorty said, eyeballing James. Not for very long you won't have. Both skinheads pulled knives out of their pockets. Cherub training teaches you to make an instant decision when you see a knife. Either grab the assailant's wrist before the blade is in a threatening position, or back away if you don't have time. James and Kerry went for the first option, grabbing the two skinny wrists and yanking their arms behind their backs. Kerry twisted the tall one's thumb until his knife dropped onto the pavement, then smacked his head against the concrete bus stop. After freeing the other knife, James punched Shorty in the back of the head before ducking down and picking both blades off the floor. He handed one to Kerry. We don't want trouble, Kerry said, waving the knife. We're just waiting for the bus. The two skinheads didn't back off, but they didn't look confident either. The guy with the long hair had waited in the background the whole time. He moved up between the skinheads and smiled. You two seem to know some pretty fancy moves, he said, breaking into a grin. You got any that will stop one of these? He slid a sawn-off shotgun out of his jacket and pointed it at them. James looked at Kerry, hoping she had some smart move up her sleeve, but she looked as scared as he felt. This is a 12-gauge, the guy with the big hair explained. One shot will blow the pair of you to smithereens, so if you want to live beyond the next few minutes, you're going to do exactly what I say, okay? James and Kerry both nodded. First of all, pass the knives back to their owners. Handles first. The skinheads took the knives. Now put your hands on your heads. Once their hands were on their heads, the skinheads rummaged through James and Kerry's pockets, taking their money, keys, train tickets, and phones. Then they stripped off their watches. Now, lose the backpacks. You know you'll be in serious trouble if you take those packs, James said. You've no idea what's in them. <laughs> I know exactly what's in them, the hairball laughed. And you can tell Keith Moore that if he sends any more grubby little brats down here, we'll give them a lot worse than the beating we're about to give you. Shorty looked back at the gunman. Can I have his trainers before we batter them? Eh? Shorty pointed at James's trainers. You said we could keep whatever we nicked off them. Those trainers are $119.99. My little brother would love them. The gunman shook his head in disbelief. Go on then. James looked mortified as he surrendered his almost new Air Max. Now, the gunman said, smiling sweetly, after we go, you're going to walk or crawl the hell out of here. If I ever see you again, I'll be the last thing you ever see. And I wouldn't bother waiting for the bus. Kids kept chucking bricks through the windscreen, so they stopped running them after dark. The gunman made James and Kerry lie flat on the ground with their hands behind their heads. Then he told the skinheads to give them a good going over. 